Well, once again, we're glad that you're here at Faith Fellowship Baptist Church, and there are those of you joining us online as well. Uh, we're glad that you're, again, wherever you are, uh, and we look forward to getting to meet with you again one day. Um, we have just a couple announcements again that we want to make you aware of. Uh, remember, the uh, services are all going up online, as well as FFBC for Kids. You'll get a short taste of that during the service, and the full video is already up on YouTube. We've started a new series on doctrine, and you'll just see the part with Professor Snufflesworth here this morning, uh, but there's a fuller video that also includes the Kablooies. And if you want to find out what those things are, you should probably go watch it online on YouTube. Um, as well, during the week uh, on YouTube, the devotionals are going up three days a week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Those are uh, going through the Psalms. We hope that that's a, a good thing that you're able to join us online for. Uh, we want to remind you of just some of the guidelines. Again, hand sanitizers available at the doorways. And uh, if you need that, feel free to go and, and give yourself some as well. Uh, the washrooms are just down the hall. You can use them. There are wipes there to just wipe down all the surfaces after you've been in there. And uh, yeah, we also want to remind you if, if you're attending a service and uh, you are not going to make it one week or if you want to switch the service that you're coming to, please either phone the church office during the week or before you go, talk to Elaine Beam, our secretary. Um, and then we'll get you marked down either if you're going to miss, then we want to make sure we know how many numbers are coming so that we can know if other people come in or whatnot. Uh, and if you're going to switch services, then we also want to make sure that we know that and uh, we'll mark you down, no problem. Uh, I believe at this service we're up to something like 24 or 26. And for our second service at 1030, we're up to something like 42 or 43. So uh, good numbers. We'd love to see even more coming out uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, just a few weekly things that are going on here at the church that we want to remind you of. Bible study on Tuesday mornings at 1030 is happening. That's with Pastor Dan. If you are coming, please let him know. You can find all of his contact info on the church website. And uh, if you show up, that's cool. But uh, we'll make sure that we have some spots set out and some papers printed for you. Uh, they're walking through the Book of Romans. That is going on again this week. It wasn't last week, but it is this week. And then Zoom prayer meetings are happening every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. If you need a link to get onto the Zoom prayer meeting, please let me know and we'll get that to you. And then the church prayer meetings here at the church are happening Friday mornings at 7.30 a.m. And uh, we'd love to see you out to be praying together as a church on Friday mornings. Doctrine is a set of beliefs foundational to a worldview, specifically a religious worldview. As such, there are many topics that fall under the category of doctrine. Christian doctrine, for instance, covers such topics as God, the Bible, creation, the nature of mankind, sin, salvation, and the fate of the world, just to name a few things. Some people don't like the word doctrine, or don't believe that they need doctrine. They think or say that they just believe what they believe and don't need to study it too deeply or anything like that. But what we believe is our own personal doctrine. It can either be correct or incorrect. You see, when it comes to answering questions about life, the universe, and everything, there can only be one correct answer in the end. The idea that you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe, and everybody will be more or less right in the end, doesn't actually work. Life only has one true purpose. The universe could only start one way, and everything ultimately only means anything when you understand correct doctrine. Christian doctrine begins and ends with the Bible. It is the source from which we can find all the answers to life, the universe, and everything. If you wish to study doctrine, you must first start with studying the Bible. If you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you turn with me to 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 8, and uh, last week we read or went through the first nine verses, which are on giving, and uh, Paul continues to write about that theme uh, in the rest of the chapter. That's just the context from which we spring into verse 10 this morning. So we'll be in 2 Corinthians, starting in verse 10, and... Uh, I'd love it if you turn there with me and then stand with me as we read God's holy word this morning. 
Second Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 10, we'll read all the way to the end of the chapter. And in this matter, sorry, and in this matter I give my judgment. This befits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them we are sending our brother, whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Pastor Dan, would you come and preach? Dear Heavenly Father, as we look into your word this morning, may you, through the Spirit of God, open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your truth. We thank you for the privilege that we have of preaching the word. I pray that you would help us to be good listeners with the intent on putting into practice truths that are applicable to our own lives. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when 67-year-old carpenter Russell Herman died in 1994, his will included a staggering set of bequests. Included in his plan for distribution was more than $2 billion for the city of St. Louis, another billion and a half for the state of Illinois, two and a half billion for the national forest system, and to top off his list, he, Herman left $6 trillion to the government to help pay off the national debt. Now that sounds amazingly generous, but there was one small problem. Herman's only asset when he died was a 1983 Oldsmobile. He made grand pronouncements, but there was no real generosity involved because he couldn't back up his promises with the assets. Jesus Christ, however, in contrast, was and still is the best example and motivation that we have for giving. And we ended last message on a high note of praise and grace in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. You can see there in your Bibles. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. So we concluded that giving is a way for us to follow our our Lord and Savior and follow his example as he gave. Matthew 10, 45, for the Lord came not to serve, uh, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then we know that secondly from that verse and from the lessons last week, that you can't out give God. But the fact that he gave so much to us is a challenge for us to recognize that he has given us things so that we might give to others and respond to him and for his glory. Now, money is not everything to everyone, but unfortunately it is everything to some people. But money money can buy lust and attraction and power, but it can't buy love. Money can buy influence and opinions, and I kind of believe that some of the stuff that's going in on our news and our world today is being bought opinions and and fake research and so on. But you know what? Money can't buy truth because truth is truth. The rich pay countless amounts of money in a vain attempt to extend their lives only to find out that they die around the same time as everyone else. And money 
can't buy time. Money can buy medicine, but not health. It can buy a house, but not a home. It can buy companionship, and a, but not a true friend. It can buy a bed, but it can't buy sleep. Money can buy a crucifix, but it can't buy a savior. And money can buy the good life, but it can't buy eternal life. And Paul gave a warning to those uh, in the book of Timothy, to the rich of all ages, he says, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith. Well, Paul probably felt a concern for the church at Corinth, and it doesn't seem that they had grown to love money. But for whatever reason, whether their, their focus had begun to, to come inward because of all their strifes and their difficulties, they had lost the initial zeal and the desire to, to fulfill the commitment that they had made a year previous to help the believers who were in need in Palestine. And unlike Mr. Russell Herman, the, the, the Corinthian believers had the resources to back up their commitment. So Paul was writing in chapters 8 and 9 here in 2 Corinthians to try to ignite their, their, the flame of their commitment to give. In verses 10 and 11, Paul says, And I give my judgment. In this matter, I give my judgment. And he's telling the church it's important for them to complete the task that they had committed themselves to, to the giving project of helping the saints in need in Judea. Now was the time to complete the work. And not to give would either indicate that they had hardened their heart or that they truly weren't originally even part of the family of God. Dan Mitchell, one of the commentators, writes, When people fail to live up to their commitments, they hurt themselves. But they also hurt those who were counting on them. Paul is concerned here about both. He encourages his readers in terms of their positive performance thus far, but he subtly communicates that talk is cheap and now is the time to produce. And interestingly enough, in verse 11, to finish the task is the only imperative in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. It's verse 11. So there's no imperatives in terms of the giving. It's all encouraged and it's, all, uh, cha it's a challenge to us. But this is the only imperative. Paul says, you've made a commitment. Finish it. Complete the task. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 15 verse 1 says, Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? And he gives some a list of characteristics. And in verse 4 he says, Those who keep their promises even when it hurts. So if we've made commitments to give and we've made commitments to, to uh, share part of our, our abundance with others, Paul is simply telling us the same way he told the church we need to follow through on those commitments. Paul tells them they have to deal with the problems that are holding them back. And Chuck Swindoll tried to summarize it in three quick little words. Number one, they were having an issue with procrastination. Anyone else here? Some of you are a little slow to put your hand up. <laughs> I'll do it later. <laughs> Procrastination is making a commitment, but then intentionally and consistently being unwilling to follow through on that commitment. It's not just forgetting about the commitment, it's forsaking the commitment. It's not just intentionally uh, being merely accidentally delayed, but it's intentionally putting off uh, what needs to be done. And the believers at Corinth had grown accustomed to putting things off. Their, their, their modus operandus word was tomorrow. It will happen when a better time comes along. I'll give when the situation in my own life improves. I'll give when I feel more like taking that step of faith. But Paul says in verse 11, do it now. They say the journey of a thousand steps begins with the first one and sometimes if you haven't been giving for a while or you're not giving as you should and that first gift in the plate so to speak is sometimes the hardest but there'll be no joy in the heart of a believer until you've wrestled with the heart issue of giving as God has asked us to. The Corinthians needed to be reminded that the time was now. Secondly not only procrastination but also hesitation. In verse 11, Paul says, let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now. Paul's main point was that between the original commitment and the time of his writing to them, they had no doubt come up with unre the reasons or uncertainties or hesitations about, you know, did we really make that commitment or was that the wisest choice that we had made? And they're hesitating. And Paul says they made a good commitment. The need was right and good. The need had not gone away. Most likely it had gotten worse. And so they needed to be about the task of completing and stop hesitating that need to give. And then thirdly, in verses 12 through 15, Paul says, stop being worried about all the, ex or the exceptions that might be there and stop giving yourself excuses. The giving principle of verse 12 har harkens back to verse 3 that we looked at. Grace giving is proportional giving. 
You give out of what you have. You don't take loans out to give to the Lord's work. You don't take, you know, um, you don't have to come up with a great fancy fundraiser and so on. You give out of what you have. The Lord says proportional giving. Uh, Dan Mitchell, again, the writer says, God is concerned first with the attitude of the individual, not the precise amount given. And that, of course, varies according to what a person has. Well, I think we all know this story. Whose job is it? Um, there's a little story about four people named everybody, somebody, nobody, and anybody. It's an important job had to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody could have done it or wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. You know, think through that one. But settling for the exceptions and excuses, Paul says, rather than following on commitments means nothing gets done. And if the believers in, in, in Jerusalem had been counting on the gifts and the giving of the church at Thessalonica, they probably would have died and perished from famine. So we thank God for the Macedonian churches, and Paul was able to re, you know, uh, use those, them as an example to try to encourage the Corinthians that some people saw the legitimacy of the need, saw their ability to give, and they gave. Imagine if we all stopped giving to our certain, the missionaries that we support. And if everybody that supported them stopped giving because some crisis came up, what would they do? Paul says, please fulfill your commitments. So Paul says to the church, stop procrastinating, stop hesitating, stop looking for excuses, stop looking for exceptions, and to try to get out from underneath your obligations and start doing what you said you would do. In verses 13 and 14, Paul is teaching them again to give proportionally, which, res which would result oftentimes in greater gifts than if we went around, and, and I know there, I was told by someone who grew up in a particular church that every year they got a letter from the diocese that told them how much the church expected them to give every year. Well, you probably get more if you just encourage people to give as the Lord has blessed you, rather than forcing it on everyone or pressuring them to give. Some say we should give in order to store up treasure in heaven, and there's no doubt about that, that godly, right-hearted grace giving will do that. But if we get fixated on simply wanting to give so that we get credit, then the Lord said in Matthew chapter 6, the same way that you pray in public to be seen, you have your reward. Some people say that we should give because it's fun, it's enjoyable, it makes me feel good. Well, one day giving may not be so wonderful and it may not be so comfortable, but giving is always right. Some say we should give to encourage others and be, be an example of others, to others. And again, the honest and best policy is to give as God enables you. Uh, so that people can see that it's an outworking of grace in our hearts, not just because we're being forced to or because we feel we have to. And then Paul says in verse 13, I do not mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. Paul wasn't encouraging one group of believers, those in Macedonia and Achaia, to give up what they had so that other believers who had nothing could have a better, or easier, stress-filled life. It was a genuine need. He's not talking about communism or socialism where everybody's supposed to share everything underneath the, the sun. But, and he wasn't trying to add pain and hardship to the believers, but rather that there might be fairness. And the word there is equity. Colossians chapter 4 verse 1, Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. If a man works for a, a day's wage, what should he get paid? He should get paid a day's wage. If you work and you give out uh, out of your abundance to those who have not, uh, you are doing it so that there would be equity in the body of Christ. Paul is saying that um, we have a responsibility, those who are able to give, to recognize that God has given us the ability to give so that we can help others who do not have the necessities of life. We're not to give to people who, who have enough and they want more. Uh, the Lord says, this was a need where the people just did not have. In, reaching, in teaching these verses, uh, again, he's not advocating that rich believers become poor so that poor believers can become rich, but to recognize in the family of God there is a current need and they are to be a source of relief to those who in that moment were desperate and needed uh, certain things just to survive. 
He's not asking them to give forever to send money to the Jerusalem project, but to give the believers in Jerusalem now what they needed because the need is now. Every once in a while we take up a special offering because there's a need now. This doesn't mean the need's gonna be forever, but if there's a need that's presented to us and we have an opportunity to participate, then we should participate forever. No, to meet the need of that moment. We know that all throughout history, and perhaps we even have personal examples, that at times we have had, and then quite suddenly we become those who need. In verse 14, Paul says, at this present time, it may indicate that the times in Corinth were now favorable and that they could give as before maybe they could not give. Uh, interestingly, Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. Now, in that verse, it says, especially, not exclusively. So if you give to places that are genuine, genuine need meters, and they're not Christian organizations, the scripture doesn't say that's wrong. We talked about that last week. But notice also, it says, as we have opportunity. And you think, well, God's got to sort of open up a door for me and and you think about opportunities as chances to give, but the word that's actually used there is when you have time to give. It's the word chronos. And so Paul's point here in Galatians, and point, his point to the Corinthians, I think, is that as long as you and I are alive, we should be givers. We should look for opportunities as the doors open to give because we have time now to give. Maybe at different times in the past we could have given more. Maybe at times in the future we will be able to give more. Maybe we can't give as much as we'd like to give, but Paul says the time is now to give. We have opportunities. So please take note that this does not mean the church is supposed to give and support to those who are unwilling to work. I think this is a message that needs to get out into our culture today. There's a difference between not being able to work or not being able to find a job and being unwilling to work. Would you agree? And the Lord says in the scriptures, and it may sound harsh to some people, but a little hunger in the stomach does wonders for people getting out and working for themselves and finding jobs. But the scripture says, 2 Thessalonians 3, while we were with you, Paul says, we gave you this command, those unwilling to work should not eat. And as difficult as it sounds at times, it's sometimes, sometimes better to not give folks what they think they want, but rather help them find what they need. Now, there are times in between jobs, maybe all of us have been there and we need somebody to support us, but it's not an unwillingness in our heart to not work that's the issue there. It's just an, unwill or an, un an inability excuse me, to find a job. Proverbs 19, verse 15 says, Slothfulness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. So the church's responsibility is not to indulge laziness, but to help people meet their basic needs, either to find a job or those who are unable to provide for themselves and their families, we give out of our abundance. And then Paul says in verse 15, and it's a quote from Exodus chapter 16, verse 18, he says, Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. It's in reference to the people gathering manna in the Old Testament. And apparently, they shared with each other what they got. Now, you know the story that if they gathered too much with the attitude that they were going to keep it and hoard it, it would go bad on them and they wouldn't have any for the next day. But it doesn't seem like that's the issue there. It seems like perhaps the young who had lots of energy were able to go out and collect a lot. And the older people maybe didn't have the same ability. They collected what they could. But those who had a lot did what? They gave to those who couldn't collect as much. Everyone had their needs met. It demonstrated uh, a, a generosity of the people at that time as the Old Testament collection of, of uh, manna was used here by Paul as a reminder to them not to have that hoarding mentality or covetous nature. One lesson in that is to be lear learned is that if you have an abundance, when it's in your power to give, as we mentioned last week, again, Proverbs 3, 27 and 28, don't wait until tomorrow, do it today. There used to be an old commercial, why wait for spring when you can do it now? And that's the idea of this passage. I uh, used Ruth as an illustration as well, that those who owned fields were not to reap in the corners of the fields. In other words, you didn't have to get every last grain of uh, corn or, or, or wheat out of your field. You, could, you were supposed to leave the corners for those who didn't own fields. 
for those who were poor so that they could do some work to provide for themselves in your field. It was just that issue of I have more than I need, I have abundance, and I'm going to allow those who do not have even the essentials to come into my abundance and pick what they need to survive. And then the last few verses, verses 16 through 24 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, deal in terms of giving and grace giving again with the, with the uh, issues of accountability. We pause to say that Paul the Apostle was beyond reproach, and that can't always be said for everyone in public ministry. But we know that money and ministry, which is God's ministry, is a very serious matter. And unfortunately, there are too many people who would rather fleece the flock than feed the flock. And Paul understood this problem. He maybe even witnessed some financial abuses in his ministry in different places. And so in 2 Corinthians 8, 16 through 23, he gives some practical steps of wisdom. And we're just going to look at a couple this morning. Giving, first of all, requires an accountability. Uh, a handling of God's money and money gifts needs a due process. Notice in the passage, first of all, that Paul distanced himself from the money. Paul was the preacher and the teacher, not the money collector. From both the Corinthian collection, he separated himself, and from those who were going to deliver the money to Jerusalem, he separated himself. Now, should a preacher ever be a church treasurer? It's a, it's a very personal question. And uh, the answer is he should be able to hold that position because a pastor and an elder in a church should be above reproach. He should be of the character and the integrity that you could trust him with that position. And let me ask the question again, should a, should a pastor in a church be the church treasurer? Absolutely not. And that's why Paul's preach, or teaching us here that he set up an accountability financial team to take that pressure and that possibility of being misunderstood away from him. So to avoid the allure of money, the lust for silver, the danger of being tempted, the possibility of being accused, uh, Paul separated himself from the collection. So he could never be accused of having his hand in the till. And notice secondly that Paul then arranged for an accountability team. And he had three brothers in the Lord. One was his sole brother, one was the famous brother, and one was the earnest brother, not the Ernie brother, but the earnest brother. And he says in verse 16 and 17, he talks about the soul brother, and this, this is Titus. And he mentions Titus. Titus had been involved with the church. He had an upstanding character. Paul says he's just, he has a heart like mine in the ministry. You've seen him work. He is full of integrity. You can trust him. And then in verses 18 and 19, Paul talks about the famous brother. Unknown famous brother. What we know about him was that he was known at that time for his preaching. He was faithful to the word of God. People had seen him, had heard him, had understood that he talked about the doctrines of the faith, and he was accurate. He was famous. He was well known. And also, he was, it says that he was selected or appointed by the churches. And one writer indicated that in the Greek, it means that they had a selection by a showing of hands. So the churches themselves had approved of this individual. So even Paul couldn't be accused of choosing a favorite. And then thirdly, we have in verses 20 and 21, we have the, or, or uh, in verses 20 and 21 as well, Paul upholding this famous brother uh, was a step of genius to, to separate him from the vulnerability of possible attacks. And then thirdly, uh, well, excuse me, um, R. Kent Hughes writes, what folly and what disdain we have for the name of Christ when we too readily trust ourselves. We have too much faith in our own honesty. Many have ruined themselves by too much trust in their own integrity. And he put that in there in that section to recognize that Paul did what was right in selecting others like this famous individual, like his soul brother, and finally like the earnest brother, to take his place and take the responsibilities of handling the finances in this gift going to Palestine. So only qualified people should handle the financial responsibilities in the Lord's work. Those who are well-respected, trustworthy, above reproach, with unquestioned, upright reputations, they're handling the money because we recognize it's God's money in the end. It's a result of Christian people giving sacrificially to help others. It's not to help themselves. And they need to be individuals who will care for this money as if it was God's own money because in truth it is God's money. And I would think there's a general warning in Scripture as well not to give such positions of responsibilities to those who are young in the faith. 
because Paul warns about laying hands suddenly on no one because of the issues of pride, because of the issues of not being, having the time for testing and so on. And they need to be people of good character. You know, there's no mention in scripture that in order to handle the, the finances of the church, you've got to be good at handling your own finances. Now, we hope that that's true. But you're not looking necessarily for people that are just great businessmen, that have made wise investments, that they're uh, skilled in fundraising, they're thrifty people, they have marketing degrees and so on. But rather, the emphasis here was on they were people who were eager to do the Lord's work with honesty, uh, humbleness, integrity, and they were approved by the churches. They were approved by many others in the congregations. And then in verses 23 and 24, Paul again summarizes his, his uh, understanding of the three omegos, amigos <laughs> as, as the fact that they have, may have seemed average and ordinary people, but in the eyes of the churches, in the eyes of the Lord, in the estimation of Paul, they were upright, outstanding men of character. Well, in summary, it's important, and I, I share this um, for Daniel's, Pastor Daniel's sake and my sake. Uh, our Kent Hughes, who's, uh, I th I'm not sure which church he pastored, I apologize for that. But he wrote uh, an interesting piece in his commentary that every pastor, and I took his notes and made it personal, are to have a personal testimony regarding the separation of church finances and the pastoral position. In the pastorate, a pastor should be separated at arm's length or even longer from the money, from the giving, from the finances of the church. A pastor should have no role in the selection of those who handle the money. A pastor should not touch the offering plate except to put something in. A pastor should not count the offering or keep track of those who do or those who give. Though I've had suggestions at times regarding the finances of the church, it's generally agreed that most of my suggestions wisely have not been listened to. We'll move ahead. A pastor should never be in a position to judge the flock as to who gives, how much they give, when they give, as to their giving patterns or habits, whether they give more now or less now than they used to, etc. I should not go, I should not know, nor should I try to guess, though I'm tempted at times, because I'm human, to know who the most generous souls are and to know who should be giving but is not giving. So it's imperative that both I as a pastor and Pastor Daniel and the congregation we serve know these details and that there should be no compromise on these points so that we can teach and preach and instruct on money and giving and finances and the like and all the doctrines without accusation of desiring personal gain or benefit or involvement. So in the final challenge, Jesus challenged his followers to be, to followers to be unselfish as he taught that it's more blessed to give than to receive, Acts 20, 35. So Swindoll says, you wanna bring back some gusto into your giving? Try three suggestions, and he gives these. He says, first of all, reflect on God's gifts to you. Considering the blessings of God in your own life. Forget about the list that's longer than a mile of what you don't have. Take a look at what God has blessed you with. Perhaps some of the blessings have come and gone. Perhaps you're sensing a lack in some area at this particular time, but consider your life, he says, as a whole. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So reflect on what God has given to you. Reflect, he said, or secondly, he says, Remind yourselves of God's promises. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says, For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for your name's sake when you serve the saints and while you continue to serve them. God knows when you serve. God knows when you give. He's not unaware of these things. He's recognizing how you're giving, why you're giving, the motivation behind it, and whether you should be giving more or whether you should be giving at times less. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul says, So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever lost or ever wasted. And we consider Philippians 4, 19 and Matthew 6, 33. If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all that we need will be what? Provided or added to us. And then thirdly, he asks four good questions. He says, not only reflect on God's gifts to you, remind yourself of God's promises, but examine your own heart and ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves some tough questions. Is my giving proportional to my income? As we mentioned, you know, sometimes as income goes up, giving goes 
down. Sometimes the poorest people are often the ones who give proportionally more than the rich. And so we have to ask ourselves, am I giving according to my income, according to my ability? A uh, pastor came to see um, uh, W.A. Criswell, um, uh, former pastor of uh, First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. And, and uh, he said, I want to make a commitment to give, a, to give the Lord 10% of my income. And at that particular point, this is an old illustration, he was making 40 bucks a week. So $4 was what he had promised to the Lord. But he came back about a year later, and now he was making $400 a week. And he asked Dr. Criswell if he could pray that the Lord would release him from his commitment because he was having trouble making the $40 a week. And Griswold's answer was, well, I'm not sure we can release you from the commitment, but I can pray for you that the Lord would again reduce your income back to $40 a week, because you didn't seem to have any trouble with the four. Am I giving in accordance to how God is blessed? Am I secondly motivated by a genuine desire to give and to show love and to serve both to the Lord and to others? Or has my giving become routine? Has it become a burden? Has it become a weight? And I have to confess at different times in my life, writing that check was like, yeah, I better do it. You know, the motivation wasn't there. So we have to, have to ask ourselves that question. If thirdly, someone else knew how much I was giving, would they want to follow my example? Or would they be discouraged when they find out, when they, if they found out how much I was giving? Or, or uh, would I be embarrassed or put to shame if someone found out how much I gave? Fourthly, do I pray about what I give to? Do I have a plan? Do I have any thought on how much to give? Or do I just give because my wife is nudging me and I feel pressured? Or, or because that I, I feel like I have to? Or, or because there's some kind of guilt being placed on me? But what a privilege it is to give. That means that you have more than you need. What a blessing to be able to help someone else in need. To be able to reflect on how much the Lord has given to you and me in our time of need. And how now we can help others. What a joy comes from giving to the Lord when a heart is fully content with Christ and all that he has given to us. And I'm not just anybody. And you're not just anybody. We're not just nobody. We certainly can't be everybody, but we can be the somebody God has saved us to be. And I can always be a grace giver because that's what God has designed me as his child to be in following the example of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the best giver of all. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have blessed us with. Some with more, some with less, it's not important. We're not to compare ourselves with each other, but to compare ourselves with you. To know what you have given to us, to know what our heart is in terms of how we uh, ask you for wisdom and insight and, uh, and, and uh, purpose. And we would ask, Lord, that you would help us to be grace givers recognizing the problems, but recognizing as well the potential and the great joy that comes from following in obedience. For we pray it in Jesus' name.